course, uh, last, last assignment two is uh, due soon. Oh, in a week. Is anybody done with assignment two? Almost. All right. I like that. All right, let's discuss the design part of assignment two. So, the, the first part is to design a class that pulls personal information name, address, age, and phone number, and then write appropriate methods, including constructors, getters, and setters. Demonstrate the class by writing a program that creates three instances of the class. You can populate information using the scanner object. Of course, do not use any personal information, right? Because otherwise, this will be in Gmail and it will be there forever, so. It never gets deleted, so. That's why. You also need to create a class diagram, uh, test runs, and submit the Java code. I would recommend creating a class called uh, personal data, uh, personal information. Whatever you want to name it, it's fine. It will have uh, four properties with getter setters that you can auto generate in Eclipse. Everybody knows how to do that too. Uh, you can also set constructor. And then you can create a print method. I think that was the question that was there before the before we started. Uh, that, you know, should we print out all the values? Sure, you can write a little print method and that will print out the property. So that gets you started with uh, creating basic, creating a simple class. Then, the any questions on that, on the personal information class? It seems pretty simple. Any questions? Okay. Then the second one is creating a coin toss simulation program. And in this, we are looking for uh, creating a coin and tossing it randomly. <clears throat> so the goal is that you toss, uh, toss a coin randomly multiple times and track how many times you get heads or tails and then you display the result. So the way you work with this is, uh, we'll create a class called coin. We'll create an instance variable called side up, uh, which can either have a value of heads or tails depending on how the tossing method works out. Um, there is a method called toss that simulates the tossing of the coin. That is part of the coin class. Coin has a toss method. And when you try to randomly toss the coin, um, you'd either get heads or tails. And to randomly toss, you can use a class or, you know, to do a random toss, um, you can use java.util.random class. That can be used to generate a value of zero or one. And if the value is zero, then it's, you know, you decide what is heads, what's tails. You just need to print that out. And then you should have a no arg constructor which randomly tosses the coin. So basically the, what that means is that when you instantiate the coin object, 
it should talk. I mean, it, it'll have a side up, right? So take a look at a, a coin object. It'll, it'll show you its heads or tails depending on how you place it. And then you're simulating the tosses. And then there is, there is a getter. We never set, we, do we need a setter for toss? Uh, do we need a setter for the side up? That happens with toss. So therefore not required. Okay? Uh, you have to create another toss method. This can be overloaded or you can call it something else. Um, and you toss the coin 20 times. So if you write an overloaded method, you can pass an integer to it, then it will be overloaded. Have we talked about overloaded methods? So, so you know, toss once, toss n times, polymorphism. That works. So pass in a value and like an integer, toss it 20 times or whatever number, <coughs> and each time the coin is tossed, display the site and keep, keep count of heads or tails. So one moment there. Yeah. This method, that's keeping count of heads or tails, right? There is uh, there are many ways of doing this. This is where you design, you figure it out. Sometimes you can create an array of objects, since we have covered array of objects, and every time you toss the coin, you take that instance and you save its state, meaning the value of the, whether it's heads or tails, you save that in an array of objects and then go through the array of objects to print number of heads or tails. Or you might declare an integer variable called heads and another one called tails and you just increment whichever one you see, right? And then you have to write a test program to demo this. How many classes do you have in this? Hmm? Three? Okay. I, I, you know, if the main is in a separate class and you have the coin class, then it's two for the second part, I mean. Right? The class diagram should be separate for each. Okay, questions. I think I saw your hand go up first on this side and then yours. Um, for the part of one, I was wondering how many classes <coughs> Just a personal information class. Right. So just one. I was showing you a little more complexity in lecture, okay. which we will use eventually. So that so then we need the three classes or like one class one one class for part two? Or one class for part one. Okay. Maybe two classes for part two. One is called coin and the other is called driver with an uppercase D. Okay. Class names always start with Capital. Okay. Are class names all uppercase? No. Don't have to. Okay, your question, please. <coughs> I forgot. Hmm? I forgot. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, if it comes back, let me. Right. So I'm expecting a class diagram like I described <coughs> in the lecture last time. I'm not looking for formal UML. If uh, I know the book talks about it, but you know, but I am expecting you to follow some coding standards, like uh, private variables, public methods, public constructors, class naming conventions, one class per file, and so on. Okay, I'm expecting a class diagram, <coughs> test run, and Java code. Do you want to submit them in two separate zip files? Like Please. Two A and two B? Yeah. You can 
Doesn't have, doesn't, doesn't have to be a separate zip file, but uh, two subfolders and organize things like Java file, test run, and uh, uh, a class diagram can be a, a JPG or some graphics, lightweight graphics file. Don't send DMPs, no, they'll end up being several megabytes. So. Not that it matters, but yeah. GIFs and JPGs and PNGs are lightweight and preferred. And if you're drawing class diagrams with pen and paper, that's perfectly fine. Then you take a picture and that should be a couple of megs, which is okay. Pen and paper is a totally adequate tool. So, and design before construction. Because the natural tendency is what? Just go to Eclipse and write code. So. All right. Any questions on part two, part one? Okay. Okay. So if this looks good, we will continue on to the next part. to delete some files from your memory. All right. So the next topic is working with strings and string buffers. Actually, there is also string builder, but um, I've, I'm pointing out the, I'm pointing out the section that you can use 10.10 10 and 10.11. Uh, that's using the latest tradition of Liang's book. Um, there are some programs there that you can also check out. Um, so we'll talk about the string class first. So string class is immutable, right? And I think I explained what immutable means last time, right? Whenever the properties that are declared in an immutable class are all final, which means uh, if you are trying to change the value of a private property in an immutable class, it cannot change. It has to allocate new memory. Make sense? Strings are immutable. And I think I had shown an example last time where if you end up concatenating a ton of strings, you are going to end up using a very um, small part of the memory called constant pool in the Java virtual machine. And, and over uh, usage of strings can be uh, can have a negative consequence for the runtime environment, therefore should be avoided. For one or two strings, it's okay. But the habit we're gonna formulate starting assignment three is to try and use string buffers over string. But let's look at how the API works so you can, uh, I mean, you, uh, like how the methods work so you can, uh, you can work through it. So what I'm gonna do is literally go through my notes just to explain uh, some, some of this stuff. So strings is basically a char array. You can create a character array and populate individual values and that becomes a string. When we create an array of characters that is in fact treated like a string, but there is no terminating character for a string, like a null. Now, there's also uh, the notion of a string literal and string object. 
when we talk about a string literal, if we say something like this, this is a string literal that is assigned a value. You can create multiple strings like this. You can also compare these two strings. And you can say is A equal to B. And in this case we are comparing value. And obviously this will print false. This will print false. If was also the same value as A, then this will print true. Now, as you may recall, the value Sally Ride is only stored one in the constant pool. That way, string memory usage is optimized, which, which is nice. I mean, if you have two or three strings and 500 variables, you're okay. And those strings never change, then you're fine. But if those strings change constantly, then you are stressing the constant pool, which is the small piece of memory I talked about. Now, since A and B contain the same value, if I change value of A, does that change the value of B? And the answer is no, because B will continue to be what it is. New memory will be allocated for the new string, and that will be assigned to A. When you work with string literals, you're comparing values. Now we're gonna go ahead and create an object. Now, it turns out that here the string is this is stored on the heap. I mentioned last time about classes and objects. Last time, last week we talked about classes and objects, right? When you use new, what happens? You instantiate an object. What is this guy called? Sorry? Uh, yeah, it, I mean, string is the class type, yes. What is A? Uh, I'm not getting the answer. You guys, you guys are saying it's an object, etc. A reference is the name of an object. It's a variable declared of a, it's a variable declared of certain type, right? And in this case, it's of, the object is this guy right here. What you put on the right-hand side of the expression when you use new, that makes the object. And the object lives on the heap. Where does the reference live? It's like a local variable because usually an object is created inside a method. Very nice. Or the reference lives wherever the object is declared. That's usually a good answer, right? Because if it turns out that you make an instance variable of type of 
of some type of class, then it could live inside another object. Kind of the notion of containment, which we may not have yet covered. We only talked about encapsulation and uh, association, right? We'll, we'll cover that eventually. Okay, so we have this new string. Then let's create another string. And we will also just put the same string in it. So now if I say this, what what do you guys think will this print out? If you compare to the, the A and B that we just created, what will that print? Hmm? True. No, it will print. Oh, I thought you said different memory location for the false. It's a good, yeah, false because we are <coughs> comparing memory location, right. not value. Okay, difference between string literals and string objects. Now, is it okay to use string objects? Just because we put it on the heap, does that get rid of the problem? No. Because you're still, you still got the same wrong. Now you're not stressing out the constant pool, but you're stressing out the heap. You do string concatenation, one moment please. You do string concatenation, you're just creating new objects, new objects, one after the other. So, so that's, a, that's a problem still. But this makes a really good exam question. Comparing different types of strings, literals to objects, and knowing what it will print out. Please. Ah. So she's saying, well, do that. So now A and B point to the same, now it will print true because so, so maybe I should do this later actually. Just so I can have my notes straight and you guys don't say that I've got an error in the class. Right. So we compared them again. And now it will print. True. Sorry, what, what was your question please? Oh, uh, I was just wondering if there's any way in Java that you could actually like set that I want this variable to go to this memory location, or, or do you change that? In Java, you cannot manually change memory location. Like there's the, the, there's a ref, there's a concept of a reference, but there is no uh, idea of touching the memory location and modifying. You can only read. That's the difference between. Java and other languages that allow memory manipulation, including C++ or C. And that's why we say Java is simpler, because we don't allow, because that is not allowed in Java. Yes? So your first example is a string literal? Yeah. It be false, right, in there? Yeah, uh, now it will be, yes. But earlier, when I changed it, right, if the values are the same, then okay. Okay guys, so we need to look at, so how do you compare, so if I don't do all this, right, and I wanted to compare the values, I would say <coughs> system dot, system dot out dot print line, um, a dot equals right. 
So now when I use the method, then I'm comparing values. Here I'm not comparing values. I think I should uh, do that. This should be deleted. So this statement helps with comparing values. So if you guys get this, then the rest of it is pretty easy because now you've got a bunch of methods you need to get acquainted with and use. And then what are those methods? Well, here they are. You have a, this is part of uh, java.line package. So java.line package, contains uh, string, string buffer, object. So I'll show you how to use the API documentation today as well, because I'm not gonna be able to show you all the methods in all the classes and we usually go back and look at the reference for understanding what uh, what methods do, and even some examples. But anyway, since I have some notes, let's look at it. You know, the name, the naming convention of each one of these is kind of intuitive, right? So in Eclipse, if you create a string and you type the name of the object dot, it's gonna list out all the methods. So you don't really need to remember them, even for the exams, because exams are open book and notes too. And if a method is needed, I'll probably just tell you what it is. I'm not testing you guys on using APIs. We have better things to remember in life than method names and signatures, right? I mean, that's the, so dot lowercase, dot upper, uh, dot two lowercase, dot two uppercase. This is pretty cool, replace. Replacing a character with another character. Trimming gets rid of uh, spaces at the beginning and end of a string. This is also nice. It's like if you want to sanitize the uh, input and you want to clean up, that's always uh, recommended. Equals, we looked at it compares uh, two strings. Equals using ignore case. That's nice because if I put uh, Bob's in all lowercase and or use camel casing in some instances or uppercase, I can compare the values using using equals ignore case. I don't need to, uh, you know, use these functions to first convert to lowercase or to uppercase uh, and 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 then compare. I can find the length of a string. Uh, character at a given location, it returns the first instance uh, compared to, comparing two strings. You know, if you're trying to figure out if this is based on the ASCII value. And if you're trying to compare two strings to figure out if one is greater than the other, compare to function does a pretty good job. Uh, we also have concat, which is similar to using the plus operator. So, you can use that or just the plus operator, it functions the same. If one string is entirely part of another string and you wanna find the starting location, uh, you can use the substring function. Like if you're trying to find Bob in Bob Singh, you can use this function. Then we have the value of. So you take any, uh, you take any value, any input, and you want to look at if it has a string, value or function works out. We look this in the API documentation in detail as well. Two string will convert anything from another data type to a string. Like if you want to convert integer to a string, or 
uh, floating point to a string and so on. You know, we, we, we can do that. Index of returns the location of a character inside a string. This is how it's used. Converts a value to a string. I've got some sample programs or a sample code snippet where maybe I can paste this in notepad and we can look at it. Because font size will be a little bit larger. Can you guys see that? We have an array of strings. And it shows you some functions We are trying to sort an array of strings from local variables, declare uh, and read the length of the array, that's a default property, and why do we have a nested loop? character, right? There's a more efficient way of uh, sorting this also, but <coughs> the inner loop is comparing each character, and the outer loop is traversing through uh, every string object. What's more efficient way? <coughs> well, we can, we can just compare strings, right? But this will be more case sensitive and more accurate. Okay, so this is uh, the string class. And then we also have the string buffer. So before we actually start looking at uh, string buffer, let's go to java.oracle.com. And I'd like you guys to uh, I mean, of course, this is recorded too, but it might be good to try this out. So, I always start with uh, Java SE, like it, it lists top downloads, so you know, it's a quicker way, and then I go to documentation, and I want the Java Standard Edition documentation. And if I click on this, um, this is what I want, Java SE. API doc. And when you get to something like this, and what I do is, in fact, if you want to bookmark this for future, just for eighth edition of uh, eighth standard edition, it's called Java Docs. These are actually docs that are generated when you use this uh, Java Doc common, right? I talked about this at some point. If not, uh, this is the Java doc comment. And if this is well written, if the comments are well written, you can, for each method that you have, um, it, the, there is a Java doc utility that can be utilized for um, Printing out the information in HTML as, as we are about to see. Something like that. So on, on the top left, we have all the packages. So if I scroll down, the one that I would be looking at is java.lang. And when you use java.lang, we have got string 
string buffer and string builder. These are the three classes we are looking at today. And you can see the string class. And it's nice to look at this now because you understand the instance and static variables and also instance and static methods. Java API documentation is a gold mine. It has a ton of things that you, that, you, that you can all use. So here is method and there is uh, at least 60 methods. So there is that value of uh, method that we were looking at earlier. You can see that the value of method is overloaded. You pass a char, that will make it a string. You pass a double, it will make it a string. You can pass it an object and it will make that a string too. Value of, okay? How do you convert a literal value to a string, you use the value of <coughs> Again, this is something you want to get to know as common knowledge, but you'll not never be tested on it. Because, you know, again, like I said, since I don't allow internet and, you know, it's open book and notes, it's hard to know all these methods. So I have fun looking at the API doc. And you don't have to know all the methods. You you use it as you go along. And uh, as a side note, if uh, I'm in Eclipse, just pull this up in a minute here. Takes a few seconds to load, or minutes. If we create a string object, and we say a1 dot, this is what I'm talking about, right? You must have seen this before. Uh, it lists out all the uh, all the methods, and then if you mouse over on one of them or click mouse click on one of them. It'll give you the documentation. So you, it avoids, you don't have to go to Java docs, right? So it's all kind of right there. And you can then select, uh, like if I want to use char at, I basically provide um, the value and move on. So char at, char at like a location, so maybe zero. Is that, what it, is that what it was expecting? So we go at it again. Dot char at. Yeah, it's looking at the index and will return a string. So if I say char at uh, zero, then it will print that, it will print h. So it's a way to parse part of the string. There is all kinds of methods. But the fact that you have these quick tools, it, it makes your life uh, somewhat easy. Questions on strings? We're gonna look at string buffer and string builder. And I think it's just a matter of looking through, well, knowing the difference between each of the object. And, and knowing the method. So. <clears throat> All right, so we'll go to string buffer. One of the nice things about each one of these classes in the Java doc is that there is a description and some parts of the description may make sense because uh, 
uh, like you know, if we talk about threat safety, that may not make sense right now because you haven't visited it. So just ignore that piece because it, it's better to read the source and learn all there is about uh, learn all there is to know. So uh, I would I would parse through or just go through some of this documentation because it also provides some examples. And then, of course, you, you have the Google for uh, other things. But the thing with Google search with API functions is uh, uh, a third-party perspective on using the function. Like Stack Overflow is a very common one that people use. Um, use it carefully because it's a third-party opinion. The, the best thing to do is to look at the source. So that's why uh, java.oracle.com, if you search and you find uh, a documentation that leads to the Oracle's website, that's more authentic. Not their discussion boards, I'm talking about, I'm talking about Java documentation. And if there is something in specific you're looking for, there is the index. It's not the best search, but, but uh, looking here is better than, uh, Googling in general. Okay, so what is uh, what is a string buffer? So here, uh, this is a string where memory is reusable. So you're not. This isn't immutable. You can increase uh, or decrease the size. <coughs> So from a, so this object is, uh, uh, for memory usage it's very efficient. Memory usage is optimal. So we will try and use, like if you end up writing a print method and you have to concatenate a bunch of strings, uh, I, would use a, I would use a string buffer. Because So of course, then the next question is, um, what are what what are some of the methods? <coughs> so to give you a quick intro, and of course you have the API documentation. We have um, string buffer <coughs> class. These are some methods to glance through. Modifying a, a character at a given location. Appending one string to another. See, it's not concatenate anymore. So when you append, what happens is it would not change the location of the original string. In case of uh, the string object, you're gonna get a new location. You'll get the same result, but you're, here we are reusing the memory. We are saying, okay, I have five characters at a given location, I need 10 more. The total location size will be extended to 15. If it turns out that I don't have enough memory at the location, then I'll move everything to a new location. That's just memory allocation, right? But the nonetheless append is reusable. You can insert a string at a specific location. So it says, uh, you know, when you use the insert at, so insert at the init location, string s2, inside string s1, right? <coughs> Setting the length of the string. You can increase it, or you could truncate it. Truncate means reduce which will then eliminate uh, the value. Uh, if you go from 10 to five, obviously it's gonna get rid of the last five, not the first five. So uh, this also comes with a simple program. <coughs> Creating a new string buffer object. 
We print out the original string and the length of that string. The original string is object language. Then we are printing each one character at a time. This is nice because sometimes you have to deal with a string with as a string array. Not array of strings, that's a different story. When you have to deal with a string array, you have got seven, 10 characters. You want to look at each character. This is the string function, string.char. Uh, This converts the string buffer to a string. The two string function is a very common one, right? It basically converts everything to a string. What is index of? So look at, look for the word language and return the index value where L starts or where the word starts. And if, if I had object language language, it will return the first instance of the language. If you have to return the last instance of a language, you need to write that function yourself. Basically, you'll call this until it returns null. And you'll have to obviously uh, strip off the string. So, you guys want to do a lab on just string manipulation, <coughs> like uh, inserting, removing things, and just building things with strings. How difficult will it be? No, it's gonna be fun. Right. Maybe after the midterm, right? Just so you guys get uh, acquainted with OOD, and then I'll throw something at you so you can parse and do things with uh, strings. Just some real world things. So inserting a string, uh, so at a given position, right, it, we find the position of uh, the word language, and then we insert oriented, so it will be object oriented language, right? Getting it? I'm looking at these four lines. I'm not sure if you got that. I'm finding where the position of the language and then I'm inserting the word oriented at the position, right? So the modified string will be object oriented program. Without, I'm sorry, object oriented language without any uh, space. And if you are, here I'm trying to insert a character and then do, showing an append. So it'll say object uh, apostrophe oriented language improves security, question, I mean, uh, semicolon. String buffers. <coughs> string buffers and string builders work exactly the same. Okay? So uh, string builders, in API documentation. This is a more modern class. String buffer was the one, string buffer was created first. And string builder works the same. Uh, it has insert function, append function, and so on. So what you want to do is parse through the methods. And uh, it has more flexibility, actually. Again, ton of methods. At the end of the day, if you need to print a string, whether you build it with string buffer or string builder, you always call the two string method. Now, if you want to get habituated with uh, writing two string methods in lab two, just, just uh, write the two string method as a public method. And in that, use a string buffer and you can concatenate 
uh, all the personal information properties in separate lines, right? Using a string buffer, and then return the string in the end. And then that'll print it out. That'd be a nice thing to do. You guys get that? Okay, so then they say it's better to write code in these kind of circumstances because. So I have class information. I have a property X. I'm gonna write uh, I'm gonna write two string method. Right? <coughs> String method is like this. If you're, you're overriding, this is part of the object class. So uh, I can say, uh, no, it will return a string, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry. So I can say string a1 equals x. And then I can say return a1. That's what I was saying. So if I have like five properties, right? Instead of doing this, I can build a string builder or string buffer object, call the append method and append all the properties, and then just return. Now it makes sense? Yes? Sort of? Okay. All right, let's take a short break. We talk about assignment three then. Oops. Ran out of memory. You can pause if you want.